Okay, so um, I thought about a passage of scripture that I wanted uh, to teach on today that uh, comes out of uh, the Apostle Paul's writing. And uh, Paul uh, writes a letter to the, the uh, churches in Ephesus. We know it as the, the letter to the churches in Ephesus called Ephesians. And uh, this was a general epistle. What does a general epistle mean? It means it was a letter that uh, Paul wanted circulated through all of the churches in Asia Minor. So he was going to circulate this letter out. And uh, it tells us some interesting things about the mission of Jesus at this particular time. And uh, it, it is a fascinating letter. It's one of my favorites. When I first became a follower of Jesus when I was 16 years old, um, I memorized a large portion of the book of Ephesians, a letter uh, to the Ephesian church. So we're going to read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And because this is God's word, I'm going to invite you to stand, and we're going to honor the Lord's word, and we're going to read this together. So here's what Paul says. Now, he's talking to all of us. He says this, as for you, Okay? As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. Now, all of us uh, also lived among them at one time. That means like, you know, we were all included in this, right? gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and following its thoughts. Like the rest, he goes on, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, God's judgment. But because of his great love for us, look at this, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, someone say amen, amen. right? Rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. For it is by grace you have been saved. Amen. Amen. Right? And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For, he says, for... It is by this grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Amen, right? Not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork. The actual Greek translation is, is better almost said masterpiece. We are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Wow. So here's what we think. Uh, Paul wrote this letter somewhere around AD 60, and uh, it was a general epistle sent out to all of the churches. In other words, Paul was saying, uh, I want this read in all the churches. I want them to understand this is, this is um, what God is calling us toward. This is what's happening. This is uh, what is taking place by the work of his Holy Spirit in all these churches. And uh, the main theme, for those of you that are interested, in the letter to the ch churches of Ephesus is unity. Unity around our thought, Unity around our behavior, uni unity around our belief, and unity around our purpose. So the major theme of, of the, the book of Ephesians is that we, as God's people, would be unified around these things, our thought, our behavior, what we believe, and what we practice. So that's, that's the assignment. And uh, you'll notice in this uh, letter, and in this particular portion of the letter, uh, follow with me here, Paul is speaking aspirationally. What do you mean by that, Pastor Dale? It means um, he's, he's giving us a vision 
of where we've been and where we are or where we can be. You'll notice in these uh, 10 verses, he uses a lot of past tense language. Well, you used to be here. You used to live like this. You used to believe like this. This used to be a part of your normal practice. But now, amen, but now, because of God's grace, you're moving in this direction. Now, it's a, it's a beautiful picture of, of what is actually in a room when God's people are in a room, right? A lot of us are, we're doing that right now. We're like, we're stepping out of what we were as, as, as our minds and hearts become clear, as we get a, as we get a picture of, of what God has done for us in Jesus and we get a picture of who we can become. We step out of like what we just saying, we step out of all this sin and all this shame and all this brokenness and all this junk and we get a vision for, for who we can become. Someone say amen to that. <clears throat> now here's the thing I wanna think about. Behind all of that, there's some really, really important things you and I need to know. Like if we're gonna get a, if we're gonna really step in on what, what Paul is giving to us, if we're gonna understand this vision, we have to understand how did, how did we get to where we are? Like how do we get to where Paul is when he's giving us this vision? And I have an idea how to get there. Uh, because I think of it this way. Now follow me along. I'm gonna give you all of this stuff that runs underneath aspirational passages of scripture in the Bible. Here's, here's how we get to it. First of all, I, I think of it this way. Um, 10,000 foot view. We are, I would say, we are 2,020 years, give or take, uh, into the greatest gamble God ever undertook with humanity. And here's the gamble. That God is going to accomplish his purposes on earth through an assembled gathering of people, say it with me, called the church. If you look at the original language, the original Greek language for the word church, it's the word ekklesia, which translates this in, in the best way, just sort of think of it this way, a community called. So we're a community called together. Now think about this. That's a gamble on God's part, right? I mean, he's going to accomplish most of what he's going to do on the earth through an assembled gathering of people called the church who are unified around belief, around behavior, around thought, and around purpose. That's a gamble God is taking. I mean, if you don't think it's a gamble, Look at the person sitting next to you. Come on now. Right? Because right now when I, I look out and like you're the team, you're God's team. And when I look out at God's team, I go, oh my. <laughs> and I know right now what you're doing. You're looking up here going, double my. <laughs> right? This, 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 is, this is a gamble. He's going to get most of his work done on the earth through an assembled gathering of people called the church. Yes. <laughs> I 100% agree. Okay, so now think with me about this. Let's go to where does, where does this happen? Here's where it happens. It happens in Matthew chapter 16. It's almost like a drive-by verse. And we get to Matthew chapter 16. I'm gonna explain it, but let me read it first. And, and I tell you, this is Jesus, and I tell you that you are Peter. He's having a conversation with Peter. And on this rock, I will build my, there's the first time the word church is used in the Bible. I will build my what? Church. And the gates of Hades, that's a nomenclature for the word hell, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. What's going on here? So Jesus is one day walking with his disciples through Caesarea Philippi. Uh, think of it uh, in Jesus' day as the, the religious, socio-political uh, uh, town uh, uh, of renown during day. It would almost be like Washington, D.C. Uh, okay, right? <laughs> did he just do that? He just, he just did that. 
Stay, stay with me. Okay, we just probably just got banned on social media right there. Okay, but here, here, here's the thing. He's, he's walking through Caesarea Philippi, and, and people are talking about Jesus, and he hears them. Here's the backstory of, of this. And he starts saying to the disciples, he said, hey, I'm, hey guys, hey, listen up. I'm, I'm hearing they're, they're talking about me. What, what do you hear? What do you hear? And they start telling Jesus what they hear. Uh, they say, you know what, Jesus, they, um, some people think you're like a prophet. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, like some, they think you're a prophet. They, they think like you're maybe like you're Elijah who's come back from the dead. Okay, okay. And then Jesus starts getting more specific. And he looks at Peter and he calls out to Peter. And he said, hey, Peter, tell me, man, tell me what you hear. Who do you think I am? And Peter answers and he says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and here's what I want to say to get to this. Um, Jesus in that moment, okay, calls out that, the, that, that, the, um, that anybody in this assembled crowd who makes that confession, you are brought into the assembly of the church and, and you become part of his unfolding mission. This is what happens. That's the verse we just said. Hey, Jesus said, hey, Peter, I tell you that you're right, and I, I tell you that you're the rock. Peter in the Greek language is the word petros, which translates rock. And he's basically in a, in a word play going, hey, Peter, you're the rock, man. And, and on the rock of that confession, I will build my what? Church. Now, watch this. Not only is that a powerful moment, but then Jesus doubles down on the moment, and then he says this. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Who's he giving the keys of the kingdom to? Anybody who makes that confession. I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Look at this. Whatever you bind on earth is bound heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loose where? in heaven. What's he doing? Jesus is giving authority and power to get the mission done with people who make that confession. That's a gamble. God is going to get most of his work done on the face of the earth by an assembled group of people with similar thought, belief, behavior, and purpose to get his work done. And what's the confession? Lynn, show us the confession again. Show us the confession. Go back two slides. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Biggest question you'll ever answer in your life is this question. I think every single one of us ought to envision that we're walking with Jesus through Caesarea Philippi and he turns to Peter and then he turns to us. Hey, Susie, hey, Bill, hey, John, hey, Laura. Who do you say I am? You're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Now, when I think about this, I think of it this way. How did we even get there? How do we get there? Like, what, what, what sort of momentum began to gather that people would even be interested in that, right? I mean, you have to ask that question. I think we have to ask that question. And I have an idea. I have an idea because I, I, I think the way that Jesus lived his life was so beautiful and so different and so powerful and so transcendent that people were just drawn to it. I believe that with all, all my heart. And if you read the Gospels, you just see it. Uh, it it's almost as though Jesus, um, he was living into a mission. And now we know this on this side of religious history, right? We know he was living into a mission. Let me show you where the mission, where the mission is. It happens in the Gospel of Luke. And uh, let me set up the scripture. So stay with me. Jesus has just been tempted in the desert for 40 days and he was tempted and um, he didn't fall 
And uh, the Bible tells us that after he was tempted, he went back to Jerusalem where his home was. And when he got back to Jerusalem, he went to the temple. He went to his local temple. And, and they were having worship in the, in the local temple. And, and the Bible tells us, this is that verse, that there's this moment that Jesus gets up and he opens the ancient scroll that everybody would have been familiar with. And he reads this, this ancient verse that everybody back in the day, back in the temple when he did this, they would have been very familiar with this verse. What's the verse? The spirit of the Lord is on me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim, look at this, good news of the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, here's what we know on this side of religious history. That is the personal mission statement of Jesus the Christ, the son of the living God. And let's just look into it for a moment. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. Now, here's what we know, right? This isn't just for people who don't have resources or money. It it, it certainly is for those people. But it's not just that. It's, It's for people who feel empty. Ever felt empty? It's for people who feel overwhelmed. It's for people who feel less than. Have you ever felt less than? I was talking to a guy one time. He said, you know what, Pastor Dale, if I were to be honest with you, I always lose. It just never flows my way. And Jesus brings good news to people who feel like that. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. That's just not for people in prison. No, it is for people in prison. I was sharing in the earlier service, we've got a wonderful man, Tony Loeffler's life uh, and his wife, Mary Ann, who've given their lives, travel around our state and, and go into prison after prison after prison, share the good news. I love that, brother. Um, but it's not just for those people. It's for, it's for those of us who have ever been imprisoned by our own addiction, by our own bad behavior, by our own um, willful disobedience, by our own um, lie that somebody said about us or lie that we've said about ourselves. Anybody identify there? Just curious. Recovery of sight for the blind, not just for those who are blind physically, it is for them. But watch this, it's it's a new vision for anybody who has ever lost their way. Ever lost your way? You're beginning to to see what's going on here? And and the Bible says, Jesus says, you know, there's coming a moment when I'm going to set all of those who are oppressed, I'm going to set them free. And here's the interesting thing. He doubles down on this because if this wasn't crazy enough that he would say this in front of the crowd, I mean, everybody in the crowd, go back and read it, they're going, hey, wait a minute, isn't, like, isn't this Joseph and Mary's son? Like, what is he saying? And then the Bible says in Luke 4, 21, look at this. And it says, and then he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Man, that was a day you did not want to miss church right there. Right? Now, here's what I think. I think people are drawn to Jesus Because in this very moment, when we look at his beautiful life and we consider all these incredible things that he did, here's what he did. He unleashed on the world a a different option from the usual option and way we seek to answer one of the biggest existential questions we'll ever ask. Here's the question. What is, after all, the true meaning of life? Every one of us, young, old, in between, we will all seek at some point, almost like a north star, to answer this question. 
And, and the world has an approach to this. I call it option one. And option one, here's, here's the approach. It's all about you. It's all about you. Whatever you can get, right? I mean, at the end of the day, life is about all the possessions you can manage, all the sex you can have, all the power you can amass. It's all about you. In fact, if you do option one, you tend to do, do this a lot. I, I took a picture this morning of myself. It's all about you, baby. Come on. I was going to post this on my social media. The only problem is I don't have any social media. Okay? But this is one, this, this is an option. Um, I, I was uh, reading one day and I ran across uh, a quote by a guy that you would probably know. And uh, his name is Jim Carrey, the actor Jim Carrey. And I want you to notice what Jim Carrey says. Uh, Jim Carrey says, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamt of so that they can see that it's not the answer. Fascinating, right? And when you leave these doors in a few moments, here's what the world's going to tell you. Option one. It's about you. Okay? The only struggle is that I notice as a study or human nature, right? That's what pastors, if they're good pastors, are going to study human nature. Anybody who's ever fully leaned into option one has never been fully satisfied. Uh, there's a Netflix uh, documentary on right now. It's, it's, called, uh, it's called Johnny Football. It's an untold story of Johnny Manziel. Some of our sports enthusiasts remember him. It's a guy that was just absolutely crushing it in the football arena. And uh, his uh, lesser angels of his nature, I would say, got the better of him. And at one point in the documentary that's now showing on Netflix, notice what Johnny Manziel says. He says, when I got everything I ever wanted, I think I was the most empty I've ever felt inside. Now, when you leave here, that's an option. But when Jesus lived such a beautiful life, he, he created an opportunity for us to see another way to do life. Now, here's what I want to tell you. Listen very carefully. It's very counterintuitive. It's crazy. I call it option two. And option two is simply this. It's actually not about you. Hey, newsflash. It was never about you. And, and Jesus says some very counterintuitive things. I mean, just mind-blowing things. I want, I want to show you one of them that, that I think typifies so much of what he said and in Matthew chapter 16, he says this, whoever wants to be my disciple, they have to deny themselves. What? Take up their cross. What? Follow me. And then look at this, because whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. Option two. If you think about what I'm saying, you have in this moment the potential to avoid years of heartache, decades of brokenness, shattered dreams. Emptiness abound. And you have an opportunity 
for purpose and meaning and hope. Now, it's not easy. There's a cross in the middle of that vision. And every day, those who've caught the image of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, bow a knee and bow a heart to a cross. And they say, Lord, um, it's not about me. Never been about me. (laughs) You're doing stuff in the world today, God. And I'd be so pleased if you'd use me to be a part of it. It's the greatest gamble God has ever undertaken. It's the only thing that promises hope and meaning. It's the only way what was or is can become what can be. And everything about Jesus' life model this truth. Can I just tell you? It's why we serve. It's why we give. It's why we show up. Why we join a team. Why? Because God is going to get most of his work done on the face of the earth through an assembled group of people gathered as the church. So when you leave here in just a minute, you have two options right in front of you. Make the wise choice. Do the right thing really matters it matters not just for you right but because it's not about you it matters in this span of time in human history when we are undertaking our part in the greatest gamble God ever made with humanity and I don't know about you I don't want to let him down I want to lean in I will remind you, for those, if you're uh, interested or wanting to serve, right, in this service we're adding, I know Jess and Beth will be out there uh, at, at the lobby table. Let's be in prayer about these things. Let's pray. God, will you empower us to see the beauty of your life in such a profound way, Lord, that it just shakes us to our very foundation that we would begin to build a life that is not about our own self, but is best spent being involved in your purposes across the world. And you've said when you do that, there we would find life and life to the full. So help us as we choose. For we pray in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen. God bless you. We'll see you next weekend.